Good morning, all. We are going to continue along with our study of the Bayes Rules textbook. As you can see, we are going into Chapter 7, which is the Markov Chain Monte Carlo Methods Under the Hood. That is, in the previous chapter, Chapter 6, we understood that there are situations where we cannot completely compute the posterior distribution and we need to do some sort of approximation method. The recommendations so far are to use these MCMC chains to somehow create the space that approximates the posterior distribution. Back in chapter six, we looked at this in a conceptual way to get a broad overview of the process and to quickly dive into the R code, such as the R stand package. What we are doing here in chapter seven is looking more on the mathematical side to get a deeper understanding of how the MCMC methods work. And at this moment, I would like to once again, thank the folks in the previous book clubs or the previous cohorts for making these slides and these notes. Today, our learning objectives include making or getting a conceptual understanding of how Markov chain algorithms work. In particular, we're going to explore the famous Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And for some examples, we're going to implement these ideas with the conjugate prior, conjugate families that we've studied in the past. So for example, we could use a normal, normal conjugate family model where the likelihood is going to come from a normal distribution with an unknown mean. But for now, let's assume that we do know what the variance is. For the prior, we'll start with a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of one. Suppose that we have an observed outcome with a value of 6.25 by the formulas that were presented back in chapter five. We know that the posterior distribution would be updated so that the mean would be four and the variance would be 0.6 squared. We need the Monte Carlo method, the MCE, MC, to spend more time around the unknown value of the mean. And remember that the Mark Markov chain property says that the next term in the chain is dependent on the current term. At first, the algorithm suggests that we're going to visit every part of the posterior distribution by going through a couple of steps. From some initial location, we're going to propose a random lo location and decide if we're going to prefer that location called the proposal for the next step. Then step two says, okay, we have a couple of different locations to choose from, either where we are currently or the proposed location. To refine this a bit, the Monte Carlo algorithm says that we're going to propose a location by drawing the new value for mu from a posterior model with a probability density function given as such. Remember that we are looking 
to compute the probability of a parameter based on the data. And then whimsically, the second step of the Monte Carlo idea is to then go there, go to the proposed location and see what happens from there. Since we're using Markov chain Monte Carlo to approximate this, and there's an inherent dependency in the process, we cannot sample this PDF in ways that we might have in maybe a, a different statistics textbook. We're going to use a couple of ideas along the way to develop today's process. We do know that the posterior distribution of based on our observed data of 6.25, we do know that's proportional to what happens when we take the likelihood and multiply it by the prior. That's our fundamental base rule setup. For step one of the process today, we could use another model or distribution to generate the proposals. So say, just for a broad reviewed example here, you could see we have a normal distribution in the, the bell shape with the greenish color, average of four, and maybe a sample deviation of about one unit. For the proposed location here in the black line segment, suppose for now we're thinking of a uniform distribution centered at some average value. And this W here is the width from the middle, the average, out to the endpoints on the left and the right. So this W, we might be able to call that a half width, half of the width of the, of the entire interval. With a uniform distribution, the probability density function is given then by this version of its formula there. So the probability of being at the proposed location given the starting location is then one over two times the half width. And that's the first step of the Monte Carlo version of this algorithm. The second step said, just go there. Now, there is some good discussion in the textbook about what go there means. If you have a current location and you have a proposed location, when you develop these algorithms, there are uh, simple versions to try out. One algorithm says, always go to the proposed location, always go to the, the new shiny spot. However, that might be problematic because say in this picture here, uh, if we're thinking of this line segment, going to the new location might take us outside the bell curve in some sense. And actually might lead us astray from where we so should be with the bell curve. Another version of the go there idea is that we would start in a current location and stay in the current location always. But that ends up being bad too, because we do need some variety in our answers to be able to approximate the posterior distribution. 
Thus, as you can imagine, with our choice between having a proposed location and a current location, we need some sort of way to make an educated guess whether we stay at the current location or go to the next one. So these ideas are then credited to these two mathematicians, Metropolis and Hastings, and of course, as now referred to as Metropolis Hastings algorithm. From some underlying probability density function, we are going to get a the probability of going to the proposed location based on the current location. And the crux of the argument is that we have what is called an acceptance probability. This is built up of some Bayesian framework. Now, the term here on the right might be some large numbers. And of course, we think of probabilities as numbers between 0 and 100%. So we do need some sort of bound here. If we really follow through on dissecting this part of the formula, we would realize that the that the thoughts going through the probability density function are symmetric, especially when working with this uniform proposal. I, I advise caution here because Recall that conditional probabilities in general are not symmetric. Um, a conditional probability is not equal to its likelihood. So remember that this is a very particular to this train of thought. Also, quickly mentioning, but not necessarily going to it, a, a formal proof, if we take this formula and multiply it by f of y, that is the aspect of dealing with the observed data, we now have this notion for dealing with the decision of going between the proposal or staying at the current location. And it's the minimum of 100% or this calculation here. That's going to create a, a value we'll call alpha for the moment. This ratio is equivalent to the unnormalized posterior in our Bayesian thought. So what this alpha is doing in the uh, probability sense, or the sense of an introduction of probability, is an unweighted coin. Instead of having a coin for going 50% uh, heads, 50% tails, we have alpha, which itself is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. And that's going to create these two different proportions of whether or not we stay at the current location or go to the next proposed location. So in the first scenario, if the probability of going to the proposed location out is larger than staying at the current location, what happens is that alpha will automatically equal one. And then that will tell us to go to the next proposed location. However, if the inequality is the, the other way, that the probability of going to proposal is less than staying at the current location, well, we don't necessarily want to stay at the current location in that scenario. We, we do want some sort of flexibility in our model. So then we metaphorically flip that coin and then move with that current 
uh, <clears throat> probability alpha. Perhaps it's easier to see this in some R code. So one iteration of this metropolis Hastings algorithm, we're going to have a half the width. We'll kind of develop more intuition about this in the in the few minutes. And we have a current location. We're trying this notion out on a uniform distribution. So we're going to grab one random number over that interval, and that's going to be our proposed location. We're going to have an unnormalized prior at the proposed location based on the data that the new average, at least in the data, would be 6.25. So that will be our possibility for the proposed location. Whereas the current location will likewise compute an unnormalized um, distribution, but at the current location. As the mathematics above presented, we're going to say that alpha is this ratio between the proposal possibility and the current possibility or in the event that that ratio is too high, we're going to cap that or say that its maximum is 100%. From there, deciding whether or not we're going to go to the proposed location or the current location, that's our metaphorical coin flip. Instead of 50%, 50% probabilities, we have a different set of weights at alpha and its complement. Whether or not we go to the proposed location or the current location is then saved temporarily in what's called the next stop. And then we, um, for the purposes of the next bit of R code, we will then output where the next stop could have been the alpha value and where the next stop is. So for example, from a current location of three and a half worth of one, that is this picture here in the line segment, a current location of three, a half width of one. We're grabbing some proposed location somewhere on this line segment. And a new proposed location instead of three is about 2.93. Going through the Bayesian ideas and uh, mathematics we started to look at today, the alpha value was about 0.82. We flipped that metaphorical coin where the probability of going to the proposed location instead of staying at the current location is about 82%. So then probabilistically, the program says, yeah, we're, we're gonna go to the proposed location. In building a whole chain of values for the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, we then think about implementing the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, but doing the process over and over again. And thus thinking programmatically in a for loop. The textbook whimsically calls this a Metropolis Hastings tour. We're going to give this 
a number of iterations and the half width. Like the examples before, we're going to start at a current location of three, it's just some value. And hope that the probabilities and Bayesian framework will help refine what we're thinking about. It's a good idea to, if we're going to compute a lot of values and store the information, to initialize the space and it'll help your computer program run efficiently. We're trying to estimate the updated normal distribution mean, so we're going to call this mu. But for the sake of demonstrations, we're going to store the information uh, after each iteration. I'm going to iterate the process capital N times. On the previous slide, we saw that we could run the Metropolis Hastings algorithm once with the code called 1MH iteration by supplying the half width and the current location. At the moment, the current location is the number three. Remember that on the previous slide, let me just go there. On the previous slide, it returns the proposed location, the alpha value, and uh, then the next stop. So the next stop will be a, a guess for mu. And that could happen if we either go to the proposed location or stay at the current location. Whether or not we want to propose location or state at the current location, we update wh where we think is the current location for the sake of the loop and then go through this, uh, say, say 5,000 times. For today's demonstrations, we're going to be building a data frame. The first column is simply the numbers one through, say, 5,000. And the second column would be the 5,000 guesses at the average view. We'll see this in pictures. Textbook likes to use this old uh, numerical code for the word Bayes because there is a lot of randomization, especially going in doing the R unique function. We're going to generate a chain of 5,000 elements long with a half width of one for now and run our Metropolis Hastings tour. We get a data frame that's 5,000 observations long. And we'll go ahead and graph that with some convenient ggplot. Now, this looks good in the sense that, remember, you want something that is, in some sense, equally or uniformly messy along the way. You do not want something that implies maybe a positive slope or a negative slope. And if you're thinking about this in the variance point of view, you kind of want the variance to also be pretty much the same as we progress left to right. So after ver verifying that our MCMC looks uh, reasonable by doing this code to make a trace, we probably should check the actual um, approximated density function and see what we get. 
the Markov chain Monte Carlo method produces a PDF here represented by the rectangles. That's going to be our distribution for our approximation by today's method. The blue bell curve is the expected distribution. That is because we use the normal, normal conjugate family, we at least in theory know what the answer should be. Since the Metropolis Hastings algorithm produced the values that got the distribution in the rectangles and it arguably lines up pretty well with the blue curve, the expected distribution. It seems like we are on the correct track connecting all these ideas and having a, a good system for approximating our posterior distribution. Now, this whole time, in this past couple of slides, we've been using a value of W, the, the half width of one unit. We've been using W equals one. That itself can change based on, well, basically how the programmer uses it, uses that value. Say the programmer plugged in, plugged in one for each iteration. But we could use different values of that half width. So let's think about this for a bit. What if our half width was 0 0.01? What if our half width was a much bigger number, 100? Or should we uh, stick with w equals 1? The poor one on the left is what happens when you have a large half width. You're metaphorically speaking, casting a large net. You could get some values that are far away from your current location. And that might push you towards numbers that are actually not all that reasonable. So on the bottom left, you could see that the density plots actually produce a mode that's far away from where we should be. In the middle column, we have a very small half width. It restrains the process quite a bit, saying that the steps that we take away from the current location cannot go far away at all. And then we might be relatively stuck in the same location, um, give or take uh, some noise. So we can see in the bottom of the middle column, we do have a density plot, but the values that are sampled barely explore the space or barely stretch out to explore the space. And then finally, on the far right column, we have the results of what happened when we plugged in a half with a one, and the results seem much more reasonable. We can also try this out with a different conjugate family say the beta binomial example. Let's suppose that we observe one success in two trials. So that likelihood is going to be modeled with a binomial distribution, two trials with some unknown probability pi. And 
suppose that we start off with a prior distribution with a beta 2, 3 model. Remember this whole time, we're still playing pretend. We don't actually know the, the precise answers. Remember that the part of the usefulness of the beta binomial situation is if we want to keep our probabilities between zero and one. And long story short, when you double check the mathematics, you'll end up with this formula here for making the proportionality or the proportion value of alpha. We'll look at the R code for a couple minutes here. We have our guesses at the hyperparameters A and B, and we have our current location. We're going to grab one random number from the beta distribution. Remember, the beta distribution itself always falls between zero and one. A and B affect the shape of the distribution. That's going to be our proposed location. The plausibility of that is in our unnormalized likelihood. We also have the plausibility of the current location. And then from the prior, we had the probabilities of the proposed location and the current location. And thus, as the underlying mathematics say, we should look at an alpha value that is this big ratio here uh, with a maximum of 100%. So if we run this for capital N iterations, go on a tour, but with the beta binomial distribution, because we're thinking about values between zero and one, Starting the, the whole chain at point five or in the middle seems reasonable. We're going to generate uh, thousands of values for this guess at the probability. So let's allocate the space and then run through the for loop with the those hyperparameters. Give it a current location. Run through one step of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. The algorithm probabilistically tells us we could go to the proposed location or stay at the current location. We'll mention that here. And then either way, update what we're calling the current location. There is a bit more on the mathematical proof of why this all works out. Basically, folks over the past few decades have verified that these ratios, um, fortunately, do equal each other. That is the, the ratio of the notion of going to the proposed location over then over the update is the same as the Bayesian framework. And moreover, we are assured that the MCMC -MC traces that we get are indeed pretty reasonable. And in our controlled experiments with the conjugate families, 
do approximate the posterior distribution pretty well. So what we have looked at in this chapter is that in the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, those notions that Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC methods rely on, we, step one, propose a new chain location by drawing from a proposal of probability density function, which is by the nature of the def by the nature of Monte of Markov chains dependent on the current location. And then step two, determine whether to accept a proposal that depends on how favorable the alpha value, its posterior plausibility is relative to the posterior plausibility of the current location. All right, folks, now that we've spent some time understanding that there are methods and some R code as well to approximate the posterior distribution and understanding today some more the mathematics thereof, it looks like next video, next week, we'll talk more about, well, what do we do after we get this posterior distribution and how do we talk about it with our audience in posterior inference and prediction. All right, that's going to be it for today and we'll see you then.